Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and uh, I'm actually kind of uh, uh, honored to have our guest on the show today because we put out a call uh, Wednesday night asking if someone wanted to come on, and he was the first one, and I was I was uh, a little, I didn't know, I knew of him, but I didn't really know his background or where he was from, and when he said he was from Manitoba, it made my day because he's our first guest from the province of Manitoba, Dan Olson. Dan, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Awesome. I'm so excited to be here. So, Dan, uh, we're going to talk about politics, federal, provincial, uh, the whole gambit, everything and everything under the umbrella that is politics. But I start my interviews off with this, the exact same way that I've started off every other interview. What does politics mean to you? For me, it means people getting up and doing and speaking for what they believe in. And it's so important because, you know, there's always this saying that you may not be interested in politics, but politics is definitely interested in you. And we can see in what's happening in this day and age, you know, if you don't stand up and you don't say what you need to have done, it's going to be done to you. So, I mean, that to me, it's so important for everybody to stand up and talk about what they believe in and how they see this country running forward. Now, anyone who's actually watching this, for those who are listening to this, uh, the backdrop of Dan's screen right now is a big giant, the West Federal Party Maverick Freedom <laughs> Party uh, logo. So I'm going to I'm going to start there uh, in this conversation because you are from Manitoba. Traditionally, when you think of Western Canada and Western federal politics, you don't traditionally think of Manitoba. You think of Saskatchewan, Alberta, maybe BC from time to time, maybe lower maybe not lower mainland BC, but Manitoba seems to be that forgotten province that whether you're not really East, you're not really West, you're kind of the center. So what does it mean to you to be a Maverick Party member who lives in the province of Manitoba? Oh, that's a good question. Thank you. <laughs> so to me, it really starts at the border of Ontario because on election night, I sit there watching the election happen and by the time it gets to Manitoba, they've already called the election. So whoever is winning, whether it be conservative, liberal, I mean, I mean, apparently now the NDP just run with the liberals, but I mean, the election is called. So I sit at the border of Ontario, Manitoba. I already know by the time I'm voting, who is the government. So I want to plead to all Westerners, it is time to stop supporting all of those legacy parties and start voting for a party that will actually represent you. Because it doesn't matter who gets elected in the West, whether it be liberal, I mean, God forbid, but or conservative, it doesn't matter. They serve Ontario and they serve Quebec. So let's have a party that actually represents the West. Let's stand up and say what the West wants, the West gets, and let's fight for it. And that is going to begin with us. And it begins at the Manitoba, Ontario border. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the attitude in Manitoba, because um, we, we, we often talk about Western politics and uh, the prairie provinces being natural resources. I want to know from you, what is being missed in Manitoba? Because I have listeners from across Canada, from Ontario to Nova Scotia to BC up to Yellowknife. And I always find it fascinating what people hear on the ground. So when you decided to join the Maverick Party, because I'm assuming you, you just didn't just automatically become a member, you joined the party. What was it that was happening in Manitoba that was frustrating you that you said, you know what? It's time for the West, and I say the West meaning Manitoba and everything, to get a fair deal in Confederation. Well, here's the thing. People always see Manitoba as a have-not province. So we really? are, yeah, we are a have-not province. We take part of the equalization payments. So, but there is no need for that. We actually have a port in Churchill mm -hmm. that could ship the oil from Alberta to the international market but it's not being utilized. We have hydro in buckets that could be sold, but it's a it's run by the province of Manitoba. Like, let's get this out there. We could be one of the leading 
uh, provinces in selling resources to international markets. But here we are just sitting back, letting it happen and just collecting the equalization payments when we shouldn't be. We should be selling the resources and being a have province and actually standing up as the first province to the West showing how it's done. So in, uh, in Manitoba, you have a progressive conservative premier and Heather Stephenson, if I'm not mistaken, is her last name. What message would you want her to know? Like, because you traditionally think of have not provinces of people that provinces that don't have a lot more money who are struggling to get by. But as you say, you have the port of Churchill, you have hydro. What's going on in the province of Manitoba that you are struggling? Because you think with a conservative government, you'd be able to get these things done. But if you're telling me, and I believe you, that you guys are struggling and you are a have not province, which yes, you are. How do you change that? And while we can talk about federal here in a few minutes, I want to stick on the provincial side here because these are provincial issues you're talking about. So how do we change that? And how do we get a fair deal within our own province before we start talking federally? I agree. And you actually bring up the most important point of it all. It actually relies on the provinces in the West. And here's the thing. As a province, we are in charge of natural resources here in the province. We're in charge of all of that stuff. And we need to tell Ottawa we're in charge of it. It is our resources. It is our choice how we sell it. And it is our choice what we do with it. But we actually need premiers that are willing to stand up and say, it's about our province and it's about our citizens. And we want to make sure we are doing the best we can for them. And that's the real thing is that the provinces need to stand up and have some autonomy from Ottawa. That's what we're looking for here. And I mean, you can say that federally as the Maverick party says that it's autonomy from Ottawa, stuff like that. But the true test is in the provinces and we need our premiers to stand up for our citizens in each individual province and tell Ottawa what's important to us in the West, not just like, you know, the, glad handing and the talking about how great it would be tell them what we want and let's go for it is the premier of today heather stephenson and also the former premier premier pallister were they chummy chummy with trudeau were they buddies because i yet again i i'm, I'm an outsider here so i in the West, you have Scott Moe and you have Jason Kenney, or well, you had Jason Kenney. So you have two very strong vocal voices on the provincial level in the West. John Horgan is John Horgan, but per, conservatively, Scott Moe and Jason Kenney are the conservative voices out in the West. So was Pallister and now Stephenson sort of chummy chummy with Trudeau, where Scott Moe and Jason Kenney might not have seen that way? Yeah, I would say that definitely Scott Moe is definitely the leader in wanting provincial autonomy, 100%. Like, he is leading the charge. He probably feels very alone because I think even Jason Kennedy, Kenny, has not led the charge as much as Scott Moe has. He is showing what provinces can do in voicing their opinion on autonomy. Uh, our premier... And both of them, regardless of whether it's Pallister or Stephenson, they continue to be chummy chummy with Ottawa. I believe it's because of the equalization payments. They don't want to interfere with that. They don't seem to believe that the province could step up and be autonomous. And that, it drives me nuts. I don't know how else to put it, it drives me nuts because we are full of entrepreneurs in this province. You know, there's people who are cattlemen, farmers, small businesses, they go out every day and they fight the battle. All we need is our province to stand behind us. You, you, you I, I was at the leadership announcement of the Maverick Party here in Calgary. If I'm not mistaken, you were as well. I think we, I yeah. saw you. I didn't actually properly introduce myself, but here we are. We're properly introduced to each other now. Um, you, the Maverick Party has a new leader in Colin Kirk. Um, he, his, his job is to go across this, the Western Canada and shore up support. I want to talk about your story a little bit here because I found your story because Jay Hill, the uh, former interim leader, mentioned it. 
you set up, and I'm, I'm going to point this out, I'm going to give you a little humble brag here, but you went across the province of Manitoba and you set up an electoral district association for the Maverick Party in every single one of the Manitoba federal uh, ridings. Why? <laughs> I just, I, I guess that's the most easiest, stupid question I've ever asked on the show, but why would you do that? Well, I, I seen the message as being the most important thing that Western Canadians need. And we needed to show that, I mean, Alberta, Saskatchewan, everybody knows that they are for freedom. They know their autonomy. People always look at Manitoba kind of like nobody's interested. Nobody wants to lead that charge, but that's not right. They're just looking for somebody to actually pick up that torch and show them that here it is, let's do this. And that was my belief in getting all of the writings at least upset like going, beginning, and then people will come to it and they'll start realizing this is an actual movement. People are actually here and doing it because I mean, in the beginning, and I mean, we can all say what we want, but it was pretty much kind of an Alberta party in the beginning. But the Alberta party resonates to all Western Canadians. And that's the message is we believe in Manitoba, just as they do in Saskatchewan and Alberta and some parts of BC and the territories, we should be looking after ourselves. We are, can be autonomous from Ottawa. That 20 kilometers or 20, whatever the measurement is in Ottawa should not be making the decisions for all of us. It's just not working anymore. And we have a way to make that work. The Quebecois, they have come up with the fact that they, know how to make it work for them in this confederation. And that's what we need here. So getting back to why I set up the EDAs in Manitoba is because it's time for us all to put our foot down, get our shoulder to the wheel, get the work done and, and say, here we are, here's our voice. So I guess I should have asked this beforehand, but I'm going to love this conversation because I feel like you and I are, we're going to have a great conversation here, but you were not a Maverick Party supporter for your entire life. I'm assuming you voted for other parties as well. I want to ask the question, you do not have to answer it if you don't want to, but I feel like you're an open guy and you, you, you're willing to put things on the record and talk about it. Who did you vote for before you voted for the Maverick Party? I've been a CPC supporter most of my time. Uh, I've never voted liberal, and I've never I have abstained from voting when disgusted with my riding person. Okay, so understandable. So on on that note, what was it that drove you away from the CPC? Because I think that's a lot of people who a lot of things a lot of people have up this on their mind is. The Maverick Party, and I'm going to have Colin back on the show because I'm willing. I'm looking forward to that conversation. Like I said, we're having Jay Hill on in the month of June as well, so we're we're doing the Maverick Month basically in the month of June, <laughs> starting with you on June second. Um, I want to know what led you to leave the CPC, or what did they do to make you want to leave the CPC to go find a new home in the Maverick Party. So here's the thing, it almost became like kind of a matrix moment where you realize I keep voting for change, but yet change never happens. And that's because I'm voting for people who are 100%, uh, they have to support Ontario and Quebec. They may tell me as a Westerner, they believe in me and I believe it because they live here and they want that. But in the reality, when they want to form government, they need Ontario and Quebec to vote for them. So they just kind of rely on our support because we're always going to vote almost conservative. And I speak that generally. I mean, there's people who don't in the West, but I think most people vote conservative because that's where we align. But I mean, they don't, they can't represent us because in the long run, Ontario and Quebec have the most seats, they have the say, and if you wanna form a majority government, it goes through Quebec and Ontario. So 
I had this aha moment where I was like, oh my God, I keep voting for these people and they keep telling me what I'd love to hear, but they're never going to be able to deliver it. So regardless of whether Maverick actually, well, I mean, we can never form government because we're only running in the West, but I would rather have 20 of us sitting in parliament telling the government, this is what we want. And I can actually look at my constituents in the eyes and say, I represent you. What do you want me to tell Ottawa? Yeah. And that's a hundred percent. That's what I believe in now. And I mean, that's what I believed in the, with the conservatives. And I thought they were telling me that, but I think we all know where that goes. Uh, I want to talk about, go back to the 17, the writing associations you set up because you can't just set them up yourself and say you have 17 writing oh, associations. Yeah. You have people in those writings. So when you were setting these up, you've just mentioned why you left the CPC. And I will be I will be upfront and say there are people from the Liberal Party, probably the NDP, who have left their parties to say, you know what, West is getting screwed. So it's not just conservative voters who have left their party, it's all parties who have left their party. So when you're talking to Manitobans, when you were setting up these writing associations, what were they telling you? What were they telling you on the ground to say, you know what, maybe, maybe you are right. Maybe we've been bullshit it too much, pardon my French, and it's time to actually get a fair shot within Manitoba and Western Canada. And that's the reality. Like, and I would like to say, I should put this on the record 100%. I mean, I may be the person who seems to get the credit for this, but it took the people working behind me 110%. Yeah. Like, my team behind me has supported they have put their shoulder to the wheel and done a humongous amount of work and i mean i would love to say all the names but i mean i'm going to say chester tuck definitely has been one of the dudes that has been out there selling the party he has been disillusioned with the conservatives running forward he brought caitlin aboard who wanted to be our uh, treasure for all of the ridings which is amazing that's a huge amount of work Kudos to her and everybody steps up. And there are people who used to be NDP supporters who are now part of our Maverick board of EDA. It's 14. I think you said 17. Oh yeah, sorry, 14, I yeah. apologize. And they, the reason they said that they are stepping into the Maverick party is because of the leadership in the NDP sold them out for number one. They didn't vote for a liberal party, but now they're basically one. And for two, they actually believe the fact that it doesn't matter who you vote for in the West, unless you vote for somebody who is just running for the West. One of the big things that I heard during the last election, and now that you have the 14 writing associations, the electoral districts or writing associations, however you want to call them, set up, is they hope that there's a candidate in each writing. Now, you and your team are going, and Colin, because Colin is the leader and he's going to be out there knocking on doors and meeting with Manitobans here probably in the next few months, new few, year. But candidate selection has to be top of mind for a lot of people right now. So while Colin would probably be better to answer this, but are people already thinking, you know what? Let's give the conservatives a run for their money because we are getting their uh, uh, shitty deal from them. And even Candace Bergen, the interim leader of the Conservative Party right now, is from Manitoba. She has a Manitoba uh, seat. Um, are people like even talking about that right now in Manitoba, or is it still on the, okay, we got three years because of this NDP liberal agreement. We're not really sure what's going to go on. Or are people pissed? And I, I, I try to say that in the nicest way possible, but are people freaking pissed at this government that much that they're already like, you know what, let's get involved and let's do this. And I'm going to say, I'm going to take it even a step further. People are pissed. <laughs> okay. It doesn't, it's not even just the people that are in government. I mean, let's be honest, the people that voted for Trudeau, he's doing exactly what they voted him in to do. So let's, let's be honest from the East, he's doing what they asked him to do. But here's the reality in the West, there was 10, 10 MPs who voted with the Quebec, even though they have a lower population now, to continue to have the same amount of say they have. So the, 
those MPs are not representing their constituents. I can tell you that. And I've answered two emails and several people I've had conversations with who are like, are you running a candidate in my riding, somebody I can vote for? And yes, that is our goal. We will always want to have a candidate in every riding, but we are not going to just throw people out there. And I know Colin is 100% behind this, and I don't want to put words in his mouth. No, nope, he was on the show, and he did say that as well. Yeah. And he did come on the show, and I asked him that question. <laughs> and he'll correct me again, I'm sure, if he's on again. But I mean, we're not going to just throw anyone out there. They need to be quality candidates that represent the Maverick Party and believe in our philosophy and are 100% behind it so that the message is always 100%. We're here to represent the constituents of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, BC, and the territories. And that's it. And they need to be 100% on board with that. And, you know, maybe if there's a few writings that don't have somebody, it's more important that their quality than the quantity. No, and I thank you for that. But we're going to take a quick commercial break because we're about 20 minutes into this interview already. And I just want to take a commercial break and then we'll come back with uh, Dan and we'll be talking a little bit more about the Mavericks and then we'll be switching into how a Manitoba man is trying to get a Albertan to run for the leadership <laughs> of the Conservative Party here in the province. So we'll be right back after this quick commercial break. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15-second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to Patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. Okay, let's get this party started again. Welcome back after that great commercial break. We are here with Dan Olson. He is uh, a, a Maverick MB Dan on Twitter. His links will be in the show notes. So I highly recommend you check him out if you uh, don't follow him already in uh, Western Canada or in Eastern Canada or in Europe because we have a strange following there. Hey, to my Europe friends, thanks for listening. Um, Dan, I want to continue on with the Maverick conversation for a few minutes and talking about the Mavericks in the, the in Manitoba. Um, you, what the issues that are important to you are not the issues that are important to the people in Alberta or the people in southern BC. You and Colin has said this on the show, and this is the Maverick way: is you you are a rep, riding represent, representative, and you represent the people who elect you. The Mavericks are for autonomy for the West or separation, depending on who you talk to, because there are fractions within the party. I want to get this on the record right off the bat. Where do you land on there? Are you for autonomy? Or are you for separation? Because I think there's a lot of people who might not be in the Maverick camp yelling at their screens right now or yelling at their car radios right now. Listen to this go, he's a separatist. Oh, he's for autonomy. <laughs> well, let's have that conversation right here, right now. In the Maverick party, where do you fall in the spectrum of autonomy versus separation? Well, I would say I fall definitely 100% in autonomy. Like, I think the So what does that mean to you? To me, that means we operate independent. We are still part of Canada, but we collect our own taxes. We have our own police force. We look after our own citizens and we look after what's important to us while still cooperating with the rest of Canada. Now, my buddy Tarek, who would definitely probably disagree with me and say that there is no fair deal and there's no chance that we can reconcile with the East and that we should just separate. And I'm not... I'm, I'm easily persuaded into that conversation. So I almost sound like a politician there because I kind of waffled on the answer. I didn't commit either way, but, but I, I would hope for autonomy, but if in legitimate, we can't get a fair deal and we can't agree, I am all for us forming a nation. You, 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 you say you sounded like a politician, but you sounded not like a politician at the same time because you said, I didn't answer the question, which no politician would ever admit that they didn't answer the question. Come on, Dan, you know that. I've never heard Dan, uh, Justin Trudeau say, well, I've not answered the question, but here we go. Or Pierre Polyev go, you know what? I didn't answer that question from CTV, but I'm just going to say I didn't answer it. 
<laughs> Where does Manitoba fall into the spectrum of how how Western they are? Because yet again, I, and I, I keep coming back to this because this is such a fascinating part of this whole story is Manitoba is not East, it's not West, it's kind of central, but like you said, by the time Ontario calls, let's be honest, by the time Toronto calls its election, we know what government's formed. So how do you get your voice heard as Manitobans as the, in, within the Maverick Party by saying, yes, we're part of the West, but we don't have the same issues that, say, Saskatchewan has or Alberta has, and let's be honest, Alberta has a lot of issues right now, or even BC. And let's be honest, BC is just a. So how do you how do you get Manitoba's issues on the national stage when you have a premier who's not really doing much with it when it comes to advocating for uh, the West, advocating for its province, but you don't have any MPs or any strong voices except for yourself in Twitter. And let's be honest, Twitter is just a microcosm of people yelling at the end of the day, which is great because that's how we connect it. But Twitter's just Twitter, let's be honest. <laughs> you, you've made me very depressed right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, sorry. So let's talk about Santa Claus for an hour and then we'll be happy. <laughs> <laughs> so here's, here's how I picture it. So I don't think Manitoba is that much more different than Saskatchewan or Alberta. You don't. Maybe a little more different than BC. And here's why. Alberta, Calgary, Edmonton, they are very socialist in those cities. So is Winnipeg. Winnipeg is 100% socialist. Is it? Oh, oh yeah. NDP all the way. But rurally, we all are very Western connected. So like any rural riding in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Alberta, BC, I think we all agree. So here's what we need to start doing is electing people, regardless of where they're running and who they're running for, who actually believe in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, BC, or the territories, and are willing to stand up and say, let's look after us. Let's do some autonomy from Ottawa. Let's be for our province rather than just towing the line, playing the game. And I mean, that's easy for me to say, because I'm not part of any of those political parties where they're going to be whipped and told what they need to do. And that's why I'm also attracted to Maverick is should I ever run and should I ever get elected? I won't be whipped into telling, you know, being towing the party line. I'll be able to tell them what my constituents believe and what they want. And that's what we need to get away. And that's the message we need to get out to all the people in the Western ridings is it doesn't matter whether you're in the city, doesn't matter if you're in the country, we all have a common interest and it's not being looked after by Ottawa. You, you talked about um, city urban versus rural and how the rural areas are more conservative and the urban centers are more traditionally NDP or liberal. You have I'm assuming you were born and raised a Manitobian. Uh, you have, or Manitoban, or however you want to call yourself. Um, there must be someone in that province, a politician, who has your back, though, right? Is there anyone provincially, municipally, even federally, that you can say, you know what? While we may not agree, at least they're standing up for their constituents. Or are you guys, or like, and I say that you guys, as in like the, the sort of the, the Maverick supporters, like left out on your own right now? Well, sadly, I'd have to say at the moment we're on our own. Uh, Was we, there any at any time? No, it's always been, Manitoba has been mostly NDP. It basically does the NDP PC kind of back and forth. They literally like NDP will run for like 16 years or whatever, run us right into the ground. And then the conservatives will have to come and pretend they're cleaning up the mess. And we just continue that cycle. Maverick to Manitoba, I think is a real new message and it's picking up steam. Uh, every meeting we have has grown. Like there was literally six of us at the first meeting 
uh, for this Maverick uh, Manitoba kind of thing. And now we average between 25 to 50, depending on, you know, what the meeting involves and who's getting together. And that message will just continue to grow. So to me, we are kind of alone, but we're not. There's a lot of people in Manitoba and any of the Western provinces that want their voice heard. They just need to know that the people that are actually saying they're going to do it, because we've all heard it before, right? How many conservative politicians, how many liberal politicians have told you, we got your back. We're there for you. We're going to like represent you. How many times have you heard that, right? So every another, election that I've ever covered <laughs> since 1988. So, so here we are, another party saying we have your back. But the message is different though. And when people you, act, go ahead. When people actually hear the message, they hear the words, we don't want to form government. We have no interest in being a government. We just want to stand up and represent the West. That is the message that people are starting to hear. We don't want power. We want the power of holding the government and saying, oh, you want to do that? Well, then you're going to give us what we want. And then maybe you'll get that. Okay. I'm going to challenge you a little bit here, Dan. <laughs> this, is, this is the spicy part of the episode. Um, I, I would love to agree with you. I would love to say what you just sold me is great and it's awesome. Like it's a cherry with whipped cream on top, the banana split. But let's be honest. I've heard that exact same speech from politicians in Toronto. Oh, we'll have your back once we're elected. We'll make sure we're, we'll get that done. I've heard it from people in Nova Scotia. I've heard it from people here in Alberta. The moment and you say we're not power, we're not in it for the power, we're not in it for the government. But the moment politicians get elected, they go off to Ottawa, they go off to Edmonds, and go off to Winnipeg. And oh, who was that? I don't know what you were talking about. I don't remember that promise I made you. Words mean a lot in today's society. Like the the like my 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 family always taught me that your word is the last thing you have in your arsenal. At the end of the day, your word is the tr the only thing that you can back yourself up with. How do we believe you, the party, the people who are trying to get people to come to the uh, the sort of the trough here and say, okay, guys. I know you've been lied to from the liberals, from the conservatives, from the NDP, from the PPC, from XYZ, ABC, but we're different. But I've heard it's I'm different many times before. So how do you how do you engage with that part of the electorate who just don't have faith in politicians and political parties anymore? Well, that is the best question I think I've ever been asked so far. And I hope that I can answer it. So and if you can't, just do pull a Justin Trudeau and just be like, look over there. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the biggest part is when you really look at it and you break down a party, most of them want the power of being government and most of them want to be a majority government. So that's usually the goal. Yeah. And that goal always goes through Quebec, Toronto, and even Eastern Canada. Like if they all vote liberal, I mean, we see how that plays out. So here, and the argument has been made that even if, let's just say there's a hundred, I think there's going to be 111 ridings in the West when the new shakedown comes yeah. out. So obviously people always make the argument, well, what are you going to do? How can you do anything if you, and let's, let's be optimistic. Let's say we elect 20 or 30 people out of that 111 writings. People are gonna say, what can you actually do? Well, let's look at the NDP government. They have 25 seats, if I'm correct. Yeah. They have been holding, yeah, uh, let's go 27. Yeah. They're holding the liberal government hostage and making them move further left than any liberal government has ever moved. I would disagree with that. I think Justin Trudeau's moved the party more left than I've ever seen the Liberal Party. John Cretchen was no NDP, let's put it that way. I won't disagree with you. <laughs> my example is the fact that 27 people, 27 MPs are making a humongous difference. Yeah. So then we extrapolate that to the Quebec, uh, what, I can't even think of the name of the party right the now. The Bloc Québécois. Thank you. Uh, they have 70 members and look at they 50. No, nope. oh, they went 
They have 30, 34, 34, Thank because you. the other 20 are liberals and are 10 are liberals and or anyway. <laughs> Thank you. So 30. And the they get Quebec gets what they want. So here's the thing. We may not form government, we may not be the biggest party in the thing, but we can actually represent the people in our writings, what they believe in, what we want, and bring that message to Ottawa. And hopefully just fight for the average day Canadian in the West and hopefully fight for what they want. And when you know you can't form government and when you know you're not working for a majority government in Ottawa, you can actually send that message to the everyday constituent and say like, I'm just here fighting for what you want. And I think that most people in our party, if they're not fighting for that, they probably won't be around very long. I'm gonna ask a question that's kind of, that, I'm gonna ask a question. If you don't wanna answer it, don't answer it. And I, I apologize for putting you on the spot here. I've never asked anyone this question before, but it seems like you're willing, you, you opened up the box. So I'm gonna play in the box for a bit here. Do Westerners hate Quebec for all the the fair treatment that they get? Uh, and I can only speak for me. I don't speak for all Westerners, obviously. I don't hate Quebec people. I think, you know, kudos to them. They have a, a bunch of people that they're electing that stand up for what they want. I believe in that. And I think just like I would imagine that, you know, when a bunch of Western people get elected and they stand up for what Western people want, People may not like it, but they're not going to hate us for it. They're going to say, like, wow, they're fighting for what they believe in. There they are. I don't hate anyone in the East. I, I love Canadians. You just want your fair shot. I just want what we need as well. Like, and we should be an equal partner in Canada. If we can do that. It, That's up for debate. The... The one thing that I've always heard about a party like the Maverick Party being introduced into the political realm is vote splitting. You would probably hear this a lot in Manitoba as well. If you vote for the Maverick Party, you're going to vote for the Liberal Party, so on and so forth. While that was big in Alberta, especially in the urban centers like Calgary and Edmonton, because the conservatives were not doing that well. Let's be honest, Aaron O'Toole was a horrible conservative leader. I know the man, he's a good guy. He just, he did not play well to eat Western Canada. He might've played well in Quebec. He might've played well in uh, the Atlantic provinces, but in Western Canada, it just seemed like people went, okay, we're done. This next election, though, you're going up against probably, let's be honest, Pierre Polyev. And let, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, spoiler alert, it's probably going to be Pierre. How does Pierre play into the Maverick Party in Manitoba? Do you see more people would be going back to the Conservative Party because he's for freedom? And I, I'm, I'm asking that question because you're, you're on the ground, you're talking to people, you're hearing what people are saying about him. So I want to know from you, how does Pierre play in... Manitoba, and does this affect potentially any gains that the Mavericks might be able to do while we're waiting for the next election? That's a very good question. And the reality is the Conservative Leadership Party has actually, actually taken a lot of oxygen out of everything that's been going on, right? I mean, let's be honest, they're, they are the main, the main news story right now. Uh, Pierre is most likely going to win unless he does some humongous mistake between now and September. Yep. Uh, I don't think he is the worst person to be elected. I mean, Jean Christian, or no, uh, Jean, uh, what's the name there? Jean uh, Charest. Charest would be a disaster. I mean, we might as well just elect Trudeau. So as a Maverick Party member, I would like to have him in government and I would love to be you know, an MP working and helping support his government get the things that need to be done. And I think that if he was elected and the Conservatives did form government, we would probably be able to do a lot of good things for the West because we would actually be able to hold them accountable for the West. So would you still stay a Maverick member if Pierre won? Yep. I, I'm Maverick all the way. And 
I don't fault anybody for who wants to support the CPC. I mean, that is, it's not like they're not aligned with a lot of my beliefs, right? Like it's, it's your choice, right? Everyone has yeah. the right to choose whatever they want. It may be wrong in my opinion, but they have their right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I mean, I wouldn't even go as far as to say they're wrong. I mean, your vote, your vote, it's what you believe in. But I mean, as long as you're voting what you believe in. Yeah. If you're just voting for the conservatives because you think that they're going to oust the liberals and change it, then I would say you are wrong. I will. Oh, man, you just opened. Oh, you've opened up like a bad wound for me. <laughs> I hate with a passion the freaking political parties who come out at the on election day or election time and go strategic voting you need to vote for us so you don't stop these people no you don't vote for whoever best represents your values and your morals at the end of the day and i hate these political parties who do that we're seeing it like live and well in the ontario election that's happening to well today june 3rd when this airs i am sick and tired of politicians doing that stop it get your head out of your asses that's my words that's chris brown the host and just if they don't vote for you it means you didn't win their vote end of sentence yes yes thank you <laughs> you you and i 100 percent agree on that like i mean let's just say for example i was running against a conservative and a liberal and the conservative won and he won because or he or she won because they had the better message and people believe them i'm down like hundred percent. But if you're just voting for the conservatives, because you think they're going to oust the liberals in Ottawa, in the West, that means nothing. There is no vote splitting in the West. The government's already formed. Now, anyone who's hit, listened to the show before, and spoiler alert, if you haven't, you're about to be rudely, like, probably never tuned into the show again. But in 2015, yes, I was a liberal in northern alberta i have been honest about that i will never run for the liberal party again because the liberal party as it stands today is not the liberal party that i grew up with and i was raised with and i was a sacrificial lamb in northern alberta as you can imagine i will be honest that you, some people in that riding and I'm, I'm not saying all i'm saying there's a small majority who will vote for a candidate no matter who they are are in the riding just because they they carry their names on the blue sign and that needs to stop too start listen start actually knowing who your candidates are because we have a lot of mps in office right now who are complete duds because they got elected because they're signed and not who they are well there's 10 people in the west that you can already know voted for quebec regardless of the west interest and some start of them were conservatives that's yeah. what shocks me. Like, okay, understandable, the liberals because they're in power, the uh, NDP because they think they have relevance in Quebec ever again, except their one seat. But conservatives, I was shocked about that. Like, that must have just irked a lot of Westerners, but Pierre Polyev didn't vote for it, so he didn't even vote, I should say. Oh, don't. That was my biggest disappointment in the past two days, is the non-vote or the there was a glitch in the system or oh come on dan you and i know that means oh shit we forgot and we we're in the middle of a campaign rally oops but oops. we're gonna go to the speaker and put point of order to make our voice vote rec 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 record it oh shite pardon my yeah. friends pierre if you want to come on come on but you you better know, I, would love to, I would love to talk to pierre about that one as well people you'd better have a better excuse for that one um, I want to talk about a few federal issues right now because you're in Manitoba and I'm just, you've got the cowboy hat on. So I want to talk about the big one that just came out just recently, and that is the federal firearms legislation. Justin Trudeau has basically become the best gun salesman in Canada, as uh, media has reported. What's your thoughts on that? What's your thoughts? What what are Manitoba's thoughts on it? Because I hear the, the CTV uh, Edmonton and Calgary all the time, but what's happening in Manitoba when it comes to this issue? Well, I guess the official narrative is Trudeau's doing a good job of stopping the gun crime. Uh, the people who I talk to, though, are worried about the fact that, again, on every crime bill for guns, the 
responsible gun owner is being held accountable for something that they have zero control over. Like, I don't know, like, if you own a gun, you are run through CPIC every single day to make sure that you are not breaking any laws in Canada. You have to show ID. You have to jump through every single hoop. You have to have a pell. You have to, like, like you are on display to the RCMP 100%. So you're telling me these are the people that are going around killing people with guns? No, they're not. And I mean, let's be honest, they're not the people doing it. The people that are doing it are criminals who are getting guns illegally and doing what they're doing. And I mean, it's horrific, it is sad, and it makes me very sad to see what is happening in society with these mass killings and I hate seeing politicians make hay out of it. The reality is though, it's not legal gun owners that are causing this problem. So if we wanna deal with gun issues, let's deal with gun issues. Let's deal with the firearms that are illegally being imported across the American border into Canada. Let's deal with that. Let's make a law that makes it harder to bring them across the border. But punishing legal gun owners is doing zero to help. Are, are you in rural Manitoba? Yes. So you, I'm assuming you're a farmer? Well, I I mean, I have my profession that pays for me to be a farmer, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, my, my family's farmers as well. We're from rural Ontario, and my, my mom has guns. Like, I have my pal, and I completely agree. We get, you get run through the gambit every time something happens, and um, I hope, and this is my this is my one thing that I, I I try to stay relatively calm when talking about this issue. I hope to God that this did not come out because of the mass murder in Texas. If they did, then the liberals need to give their head a shake and just slap their faces for five seconds and say maybe wait a week, two weeks, and then introduce this or do whatever you need to do, but it seemed a little fishy to me that you introduced gun legislation right after one of the worst mass suicide killings in uh, Texas, but. And how many days after was it? Like four. <laughs> exactly. It's I, making hay out of something that should not be. No, it, you, 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 and yeah. Yeah. Fair For enough. Now, exactly, we'll leave it there. I wanna talk about energy now for two seconds and that is Natural resources, getting our oil to market, and as an Albertan, you're gonna be you're gonna be speaking for a province here, man. So you better come prepared for this question. What do Manitobans think about building a pipeline through their province to get our mark our natural resources to tidewater, so that way, like Energy East, getting our natural resources to Nova Scotia, so they can refine it, so we can actually lower some of these goddamn freaking high gas prices. <laughs> well, I think that we should stop worrying about the East because they're not interested in our resources, obviously. They've made it very clear that the only thing they'll approve is drilling off of the East Coast, but God forbid we do anything in the West. They've made that very clear. So I would be for 100%, let's do the pipeline through Churchill and let's get the resources across the seas to our allies, you know, United Kingdom, uh, France, wherever, and get get it going. I mean, let's just skip the East. If they want to live without our oil, then let them live without our oil. We should be benefiting from the oil that we have here. I think we should be refining it here. Like, that's just me. Like, yeah. it's our resources. Why are we sending it somewhere else to get refined? But that's just me. But that would perhaps lean on uh, the first Trudeau that was in power, right? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> Which also leads back to you being a liberal back then. Hey, no, no, I did not say that. I <laughs> said I was a liberal in the nineties. Okay, John Cretchen and Paul Martin. Let's 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 call it what it is. <laughs> I am no, 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 no. Um, okay, we have a quick another quick break here, and then we'll be back, and we're going to be talking about Alberta politics here for a few minutes before we wrap up. So we'll be right back after this commercial break. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite. Be sure to hit that subscribe button today to be kept in the loop of all the great episodes that are coming up on the show. Also, 
Click on the links in the show notes and follow our social media pages as well. <laughs> we are back with Dan Olson, the Maverick of Manitoba Dan or Maverick MB Dan on Twitter. Links in the show notes. Uh, Dan, we are going to talk about Alberta politics because why not bring an uh, Ontario transplant to Alberta and a Manitoba together to talk about Alberta politics? What's the worst that could happen? Seems legit. Uh, you, uh, I, I saw literally as we were about to record this, you were posting stuff on your uh, social media pages about getting a former Maverick leadership candidate into the running for the UCP leadership here in the province of Alberta. Tariq, Tarek Analga, I'm going to pronounce his name right once, at least once during this episode, <laughs> Tarek. Um, what's your decision behind throwing your support behind Tarek and getting him to run? So first of all, obviously I'm a Manitoban, so I don't really have any influence on Alberta politics. But the reason I would support Tarek and the reason I would send to all Albertans when they think about who they're going to vote for or if he throws his hat in and you should be convincing him to do it is because one, he's 100% for Alberta. Two, he will be a premier that will actually stand up to Ottawa. His message has been clear from day one, adios Ottawa. That is the key. He is all about Alberta being for Alberta. And that has been his message all along. I mean, obviously he expanded that to the Western provinces because he believes that we all from Ontario or from Manitoba West have the same beliefs and the same uh, ideals that we fight for. But if you had somebody in Alberta politics that is gonna be on your side, Tarek Alnega will be that guy. He will, he's not a career politician. He has no uh, dirt on him. He has, he's not hurt by all these people who have run before him and done all these things they've done in Alberta. He'll just be there for you. And that'll be his message. And I think that would be amazing for Alberta. And I mean, obviously in a guilty way as a Maverick party member, I want somebody elected as premier that will fight for autonomy from Ottawa and will bind all of us. And he could be the guiding light who will show the other premiers in the Western provinces, you can actually do it because that's the provincial jurisdictions that you fight for. You just have forgotten to fight for them. You, I, I, I had the pleasure of meeting Tarek during the leadership race. I've had him on the show. He, he seems like a very great guy. I want to take a moment here and I know I shouldn't, but I'm going to say this for anyone who's listening to this. And we have some listeners who might fall into this camp. When we posted that Colin had won the election, um, so the Twitterverse, which you know should never be believed, but the Twitterverse was very uh, negative about Tarek, and the Mavericks rallied around him quite quickly. Um, I've never seen a party being so unified to say, screw you, you're not coming for one of us, because while uh, whether you're in Manitoba, BC, in Northwest Territories, Alberta, Saskatchewan, a Maverick is a Maverick and a Canadian is a Canadian. And I was so impressed that the Mavericks said, you know what, you do not come for one of us and you do not spew that hate. You guys are a family, aren't you? We are. And, you know, the moment Herrick and I met, you know, about an hour into our relationship, he was like, you're a brother. And I was like, yeah, you're my brother too. And that's the reality is because we just think alike. And it doesn't matter whether it's Tarek, it doesn't matter if it's Colin or Jay or any of the people that are in the Maverick party, regardless of our small differences that we may have in the long run, we think alike, we believe alike. And it doesn't matter whether you are born in Canada or come to Canada. The message is, do you believe in Canadian politics and Canadians as we are? And Tarek embodies that. He came here. He loves it. Like the moment he got to the West, he was like, I am home. Yeah. 
I mean, what more can you ask for? His story is such an amazing story too. Coming here for a rodeo, or not even, I think it was for a rodeo and then falling in love. Like it's the quintessential Canadian dream, but uh, I wish more people would actually learn what that dream was because there's so many people that are so lethargic when it comes to our beliefs and our values that anyway, anyway, that's where we're there. <laughs> I want to go back to the leadership race because yeah, like I said, you, 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 you're a Manitoba. I'm from Ontario. We, we, I, while I have skin in the game, I can take out a membership. How do you convince them? How do you convince a man that had just went through a leadership race to get involved? Or have you had conversations? Are you the only one who is supporting him? Is there other people around him who are pushing this man to get going? There is a lot of people that want Tarek to take on this challenge. And here, I, I don't know if I'm going to speak out of turn, and I hope that Tarek will forgive me when he sees this if I speak out of turn. I'm, so this is the clip that I use for the show that I'm going to be like, here's what he said about Tarek. He's officially a <laughs> candidate. <laughs> Joking. Anyway, continue. <laughs> Tarek doesn't want the power or the leadership. That's not what he's in it for. He's actually in it to represent the people and his values which are Albertan values, which are Western values. So, I mean, although I shouldn't be saying what Albertan values are because I don't live there, but I have a pretty good idea because I believe that mine are pretty much the same as his, yours, and most people that live in the West. You know, we are a bunch of people that believe in working for what you want, doing what you need to do, helping out your neighbor, and making sure that we're all doing good. That's, that's the point of this all. And that's what Tarek brings to the table. He's not a politician, never has been, probably won't be. Even if he won, he probably still wouldn't seem like the politician because he would still just be out there doing his thing. Yeah, I, I can't speak for every, uh, every Westerner or every Canadian when I say this, but the one thing that should unite this country is our, is our, is our, is our mont is the actual like true north strong and free like yes. if if a canadian can't live up to that like we are we are truly the greatest country in the world i believe like we have our faults every country does i believe we are the greatest country that has ever existed yes we've had our faults yes we've screwed over people but we are a work in progress and we learn from our mistakes my issue is when, and this is where I think we might disagree a little bit here, is when we, when we weaponize words against each other and saying you're not Canadian enough or you're not Westerner enough, and I could, we could actually agree on this, that's when I get turned off from certain political fractions and factions and say, okay, I'm a Canadian. I bleed Canada. I love Canada. I love this country that we live in. Like, if there's a vacation to be had, I go to Canada. I'm not going to the United States. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying in this country because I love it. And I believe that we should support our country. But when I see people utilizing, I'm not Canadian enough because I don't own a gun, which I have my power license, but I don't own a gun, doesn't mean that I'm not Canadian just because you own a gun and I don't. So that's where I just... I know that has nothing to do with Tarek, but it's just when you talk about values that I want to continue on that because... You, you, you actually tied in Tarek's values and how he believes about Canada and how we all believe, I believe, for the most part. You talked about probably the 1% or even less yep. of the people that spew hate and talk about garbage that nobody needs to hear. And I... I was actually defending Tarek on Twitter and was rather angry with a few of the people who were talking the garbage they were talking. And I'm not going to give it airtime here. No. But here's Tarek to a T. He literally goes, Hey, Dan, there's one or two of them that believe that the rest of them don't. And who cares? Yeah. Like that's it right there. That's the reality. It's the vocal minority, the vocal 1% minority that seems to always be the loudest and it always gets people riled up and it riled me up a little bit when I saw that. Oh. And I was at the point where I was like, okay, just step back and don't say anything. But yes, like I did the... <laughs> no, <not really. laughs> yeah. um, 
And Dan, I want to leave on this question for you. What does the future look like for the Maverick Party and yourself in Manitoba? Oh, the future is so bright. And I'm so excited for the Maverick Party going forward. We have our elected leader. So that's in the background. We don't have to worry about that anymore. That's done. We have basically filled all the council members. We are forming the party. Everything is moving forward 100% in Manitoba. It's great. I have my team that has been working with me who are fantastic. Uh, they're uh, like, we are, it's so exciting. Like I, I'm almost speechless in the fact that although we're a small party right now, the future is so bright and so exciting. And I'm looking forward to every moment that comes forward. Well, Dan, I want to thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Like I said, 45 minutes to an hour. I think we're actually on the hour mark as we're speaking. Uh, but thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor and a pleasure. You know, you having me here, this was obviously a very spontaneous, for lack of a better word. But this has been fantastic. You've actually help me solidify my belief in the Maverick Party and where we're going and what we're doing. And this conversation has been amazing. Oh, well, thank you. I, 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 I'm willing to take that compliment. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you want to follow Dan, the link in the show notes to his Twitter feed will be there. Highly recommend that you go over and check him out. Um, Dan, thank you so much. And remember, everyone, um, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Uh, and my last statement, as always, Get out from behind social media and go have a godforsaken conversation with somebody. It's a weird concept, but it helps our democracy grow and it helps our society be better. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, guys, keep talking. Did you just uh, clap? Did you just yeah, I clap? Did. I'm, I leaving did. The, I I'm leaving this party in because you're the first person <laughs> to ever clap. Talk to you later, guys. <laughs>